You glad you're in the Lord's house? Say amen. amen. If you love America, say amen. amen. Turn your hand on page 51 in light of 9 11. I figure we might just honor our country tonight. The Bible said in Colossians 3, I think it is, whatsoever you do, do heartily unto the Lord. And we live in this world, we have to serve in this world, and I think it'd be good if we just honored our country for a verse or two tonight. Page 51, America. My country. wash my sins away. Yeah. 
day when he washed my sins away. Page 130, I never shall forget that day when he washed my sins away.
you glad he's alive? Amen. If I served a dead God, what a miserable soul I'd be. But I'm thankful that he is alive. He is well. And I know we'll all get to that point. Uh, one of these days we'll all have to retire. We may end up in a home somewhere. But I'm glad that we don't have to worry about God giving up. We don't have to worry about Him giving up His control. We don't have to worry about Him giving up His majesty, His His deity, or anything else. I'm glad that He is and He always will be. Amen? Amen. I'm thankful for that tonight. Again, I want to say thank you for being here. Uh, Our evangelist this week is uh, Brother Duane Moore. Uh, You can call him D-Wayne if you want, but uh, you'll be wrong. It's Duane. It's actually Duane. There ain't no W in it, but you can call him whatever you want. I found out he's good even if you call him late for lunch. Uh, We were supposed to meet for lunch at 11, and it was closer to 12, but he was still cordial. He's still friendly, so I I guess even if you call him late for lunch or supper, he'll be just fine. Amen. Um, We're going to take up a love offering. This is one of those things you you mean i got to give to something I have no idea if he can preach or not. Just take it on faith. He can, he can preach, and so if you'll uh, be so kind as to give in the love offering, everything you give will go to the preacher and uh, ask Nick and Kurt if they would to come. Now, if you don't have to give, you don't have to fret over it. Uh, this is, this is I told our folks that we would be doing this, and so I encourage our folks especially to give tonight. Uh, but, uh, Brother Nick, won't you pray for us and ask the blessing on the offering, and uh, then we'll let them play a little while. includes brother Avery. So if it does, I apologize. But uh, if y'all want to come on up and brother David will get you situated with microphones and whatnot, but you pray for them as they come. And uh, as they are coming, um, I'll go ahead and tell you, brother Reese is going, brother Reese Key, pastor at Greater Vision across the across the county, uh, a little piece in December, the first uh, the first week, be Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, uh, he is having a jubilee, and uh, he's got a um, uh, several preachers be there. Brother Josh Montgomery, Brother Chris Simpson, Brother Jim, Brother Brother Mark Stroud. He's just he's just in for a good time, so he's liable to be there. Um, but uh, uh, again, if you're if you're in the area, I'm sure that uh, you'd enjoy that meeting. All right, so you pray for the ladies as they sing, and we may have. Uh, so David may have y'all sing right before the preacher, all right?
Trained them right. You, you teach them that. I'm glad he's still alive in 2023. I'm glad he's alive in my soul. I'm glad I know him tonight. Oh, to be there when the Savior
that's measured by the smallest mustard seed. And all our mountains, they can all be conquered. my senses. I was alive. I was well for 12 years, but I was dead in sin. But on that day, April 24th, 1992, it was that day, Nick, that God truly made me alive. And I praise his holy name for that today. And mm, There's been a lot of days, Brother Jody, that has gone by that I failed him. A lot of days. And, and I regret them. I do, I do, but I'm so thankful that he's been there, preacher, to forgive me, to pick me up, to put me back on that right path, and and set me back on on the straight and narrow, and I'm thankful for grace, I'm thankful for mercy, and I want you to know today, if you, boy, something something you said, and I don't know who you're talking about, but some preacher that said, if you don't get anything else, if you've not heard it today, I want you to know that Jesus loves you. Man, that hit me like a ton of bricks yesterday. You know how many people that might be here today that haven't heard that they are loved by a loving God, a loving Savior. Now, don't misunderstand me. There is wrath. There is judgment wrapped up in who this God is. But I'm glad that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever, that's you, that's me, that's us that do not deserve it, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I'm thankful today that I can stand here and unashamedly and unabashedly say that God loves you today. Amen. 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 I praise the Lord for the good singing that we've had. I praise the Lord for Him being here with us tonight. I ask our preacher if he would to come forward and uh, be ready to preach for us tonight. I want us to pray just one more time uh, this evening. Brother Jim, you're sitting all the way in the back. Would you care just to pray? And ask the Lord to bless us tonight. Yes. God here. Yes. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. 
All right, well, it's a joy to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. Amen. Listening to the dent sing that song kind of made my mind go back. I could hear Dean Swift singing. I'm a walking, talking miracle. Amen. Amen. And, uh, man, I say to you this evening, if you know the grace of God and it's been manifested in your heart and in your life, then you're a walking, talking miracle. Amen. Far baffles and belittles anything that we could ever imagine the grace of God that has manifested itself yes, sir. in a pile of clay and made you a fit subject for heaven. Amen. 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 The Bible speaks about he hath made us meet to be partaker. And that, that means that, that he's made us, it's, it's made us appropriate. It's made it where it fits us. Yes. And we sure didn't deserve that in that first birth. But thank God for a second birth. Amen. Thank God for a second birth. Well, it's been a good day. I trust you've had a good Monday. Find your place tonight. I'm in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 24. Luke, chapter number 24. That's where we'll take our text. And uh, you look with us in the Word of God. Appreciate you coming out. Great crowd for Monday night. Full house. And I sure appreciate it. Some pastors and preachers in the midst. And visitors, thank you. I know you're busy. I appreciate you taking time from your schedules to come and be a part of these moments of meeting. And I sure appreciate what God did for us on yesterday. Amen. Enjoyed the fellowship with Brother Jamie and his family. He took me down to Plains and fed me a good meal and then some delightful peanut butter ice cream. And it would be a sin to get this close and not get a cup of peanut butter ice cream. Amen. I am not going home Thursday. I am actually going to Cleveland, North Carolina. Uh, when I leave here, I'll be preaching at uh, 7 o'clock in Cleveland Thursday night. And uh, But if I was going home, I believe I would find the local dry ice provider and take some of that good home with me. Amen. Uh, anything peanut butter is halfway good anyway. Say amen right there. may not be good for you. We just have to continue to tell ourselves it is protein. Somebody say amen right there. And so I do enjoy, appreciate that. Enjoyed the dinner tonight, supper with the Dewberries. Appreciate them uh, working so hard, providing such a wonderful meal as well. So Luke chapter number 24, familiar text from our scripture tonight. Uh, but I want to lift a thought out of this that I trust will help us this evening. You're no doubt familiar with this story. It's uh, repeated in two of the Gospels, um, although most of the details that we know about this this encounter in Luke chapter 24 is found just here. It's in Luke chapter 24. The Lord has risen. We know that from the first verse in chapter 24. And, uh, and, 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 and yet, word has not fully, or I should say, he has not yet appeared fully to his disciples. And so, even though he is beginning to appear to many, there's some that he has not yet shown himself to. And it's evident that this, these two disciples that I'm going to read about tonight and preach about, uh, beginning in verse number 13, that they have not yet seen the risen Savior. So let's pick up our reading with that thought in mind in verse number 13. It's a lengthy reading, so you bear with me while we read the Scripture tonight. The Bible said, And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furloughs, seven and a half miles. So just perhaps a little bit further than from where we are back into town. I guess if you went up into downtown Americas, about seven miles, seven and a half miles. And the Bible said, and they talked together of these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holding that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communication are these that you have one to another as you walk and are sad? And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen visions of angels 
which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures all the things or the things concerning himself. Wouldn't you have liked to listen to that sermon? Amen. And they drew nigh in the village whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them, and it came to pass, as he said, it meet with them. He took bread and blessed it and break and gave to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, in verse number 32, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the Scriptures? They rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and uh, and found uh, uh, returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them saying the Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon and they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in uh, breaking of bread so that's reading down through verse number thirty five thirteen to thirty five a lengthy passage of scripture but I'm I want to focus for a little bit on verse number 32, if I could. You see the context that lies ahead of us. The Bible reminds us that these disciples often referred to affectionately as the Emmaus two. One of them we know, his name is Cleopas, the other is unknown. There's been a good bit of speculation through the years that perhaps it was his wife that traveled with him that day. And 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 uh, though there might not be any biblical premise to make that assessment, there was a very practical assessment. Somebody had to make the bread when he got there. Say amen. And so the Bible tells us that one is named, one is unnamed, and they travel seven and a half miles. Somewhere along that journey, Jesus shows up. He begins to walk with them. And for the, for the length of that journey, however long it takes to travel seven and a half miles, at least a couple of hours with a rapid walk, no doubt, uh, for that entire conversation, Jesus expounds unto him, the scriptures that pertain to himself. And then you saw the text. The Bible said in verse number 31 that he opened their eyes and they knew him. But when they knew him, he vanished out of their sight. And this was the assessment that they made in verse number 32. They said one to another, did not our heart burn within us? That's where I want to drop anchor for a little bit this evening. And for a bit, I want to preach on this subject, holy Heartburn. Amen. Holy heartburn. I'd like to draw an analogy. Oftentimes in the scripture, the Bible does uh, just that. It takes natural subjects and makes spiritual applications. And I'd say there's one of those obvious to us if I am going to preach on holy heartburn. I've had heartburn many times in my life. I, I actually take medication for it every day of my life. Because if I don't, it gets out of control quite quickly. Could I have an amen right there? I remember, I remember when I was about 30 years of age that I started having that, these kind of problems, you know, indigestion, heartburn, whatever you want to label it as. And so I, I went to the doctor and he said, yep, you've got heartburn. And uh, actually he called it something else. He said, you've got GERD. I said, GERD? Then he said, yes, GERD stands for gastroesophical reflux disease. The next thing I expected out of his mouth was how many months I had to live. I, I figured it was about over, something as terribly sounding as gastroesophical reflux disease. And I said, am I going to make it, doctor? And he said, you'll probably make it. He said, it's treatable. And I said, how are we going to treat this? And he said, well, you can't eat after 5 o'clock. You have to elevate the head of your bed, cut out your fried foods, your spicy foods, your greasy foods, anything that has any flavor in it. By the way, you can't have chocolate, can't have sugar. You take all those things out of your diet, eat bread and water, I think was pretty much what he did that he didn't really say, and you'll be all right. I said, what else is the other option? Amen. And so he prescribed a little pill, and I've been on that pill for 27 years, and it does a pretty good job. Somebody say amen right there. But this matter of heartburn, I, 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 by way of introduction to my thought tonight, I, I noticed that if you study this 
GERD, this gastroesophageal reflux disease, you'll find that in the natural sense, first of all, it's caused by your diet. Almost without exception, you can control heartburn by controlling what you eat. And I, I would say spiritually minded, Brother Kurt, that if our heart's not burning within us, uh, it's probably evidence that somewhere our diet's got out of balance. Amen. And, uh, and, so, and so heartburn uh, is caused by what you eat. Caused, uh, and number two, I, I would make mention of this. Heartburn is something that you won't get over very easily. Right? I was preaching for a preacher not so many years ago, two or three years ago, I guess, and we were in a day-night meeting, and, and I knew he had some sick folks. I came in in the morning service, and to be honest, as we say down south, he looked like death warmed over. You can say that as long as you say bless your heart afterwards, amen. And he looked pretty rough. I mean, he just looked like he hadn't slept any. And I asked him, I said, uh, I called him by name, and I said, Brother, are you all right? Is everything okay? And he said, no. He said, I have the worst case of heartburn that I've had in years. He said, I tried everything I had in my medicine cabinet, all the home remedies. And he said, all night long, I... I was stricken by this case of heartburn. May I say to you that, that, that if you're getting over easily what you're getting in church, you probably are not getting everything you need to get. Because this matter of, of, of walking with God and having a heart on fire for God, or we might just say having a heart for God, is not something that's up and down. And there's too much in and out. There's too much yay today and nay tomorrow. There's too much Sunday religion that doesn't make it until the kickoff of the football game on Monday night. It just ought not be that way. You get a hold of something from God, it ought to affect you for a little longer than a couple of hours. Say amen right there. And then I'd say this, that if you get a good case of heartburn, it'll change your plans. Amen. You ever seen that commercial? It's for one of the over-the-counter heartburn medications, and and it shows the person fighting like with boxing gloves, a piece of pizza, or or a spicy chicken wing. Amen. Hey, you know what? If you ever get something from God that's genuine, if you ever get a hold of something real spiritually, can I tell you it's going to change your plans? Amen. If you had a heartburn, you want to rest, you won't rest, you want to lay down, you can't lay down. Amen. You want to sleep and you'll not be able to sleep. It'll change your direction. It'll change your plans. You want to eat something like this, but you know you can't eat something like this. And so you'll go over here and you'll take something different. And may I say to you that if you ever get a real dose of something burning in your heart for God, you'll be different tomorrow. You'll change your outlook, you'll out, your, your plans will change, your future ideas will change, the way you look at things will change, and I'm going to tell you this, the things that are important to you will change too, amen. And so I'd say there's something to be said uh, about a case of holy heartburn, amen. If there's anything, and I know these days are labeled revival, the concept of revival is just that. Uh, did not our hearts burn within us this matter of hope? If you want your heart to be set afire for the things of God and by the things of God, I believe there's some things in the context of Luke 24 that we ought to consider. Write this down, number one. I want you to look with me in verse number 15. The Bible said in verse 14 that as they talked together of the things that had happened, Verse number 15 said, It came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, uh, Jesus himself drew near. Amen. Amen. Jesus himself drew near. I I want you to understand that if you and I are ever going to have holy heartburn, it'll begin when we consider the coming near of the Savior. Amen. Amen. Well, I sure remember the day Brother Jamie was talking about when he was 12 years old and he got saved and, and uh, he was recalling the day and, and, and we sing songs. I, I, I shall not forget the day when the Lord saved me. Why? Because there is a point in our lives, there is a time in our past when we were born into the family of God and on that moment, in that hour, Jesus came by our way. 
the coming near of the Savior. It's a type or a picture of our conversion and nothing ought to excite us and nothing ought to thrill us like being born again. I guess I've come to the conclusion in my years of ministry as I come in and out before congregations, sometimes preaching to the same group of people for 20 years or 30 years or 40 years in time, and I come in before them and out before them. Here's the thing that bothers me, Brother Keith. Here's the thing that bothers me. We've lost our all of what Christ did for us when He saved us. Yeah, amen. amen. It ought to thrill us just for the general idea that that somebody like Jesus would come to somebody like us. I'm talking about somebody that's so high and so holy, and he would take notice of somebody that's so dirty and so lowly. That's amazing to me. And I don't know about you, but that excites my heart to think about Jesus came to where I was. Squire Parsons said the gulf that separated us from Christ our Lord was too vast that we could never cross. But I cried, oh God, I cannot come to where you are. In the words of that great song, he said he came to me. And we were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel without hope and without God in the world. But Jesus passed by. I'm reminded of the coming near of the Savior, a type or a picture of our salvation. Notice with me that, first of all, the evidence of our conversion. Number one, there's the potentate. The Scripture said Jesus Himself drew near. Amen. Just stop for a moment and think about the reality that the King of Kings took notice of somebody like you. Amen. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords took notice of somebody like you. I I saved when I was seven years old. My family lived in the first mobile home in Pine Valley Mobile Home Park in Larksville, Georgia. First mobile home on the right as you started down into the mobile home community. Right there on the right, could I tell you that the governor didn't know who I was. Uh, the president didn't know who I was. Uh, I'll be honest, the mayor of Lawrenceville, Georgia, didn't know who I was. Uh, I'm not even sure my neighbors knew who I was. Uh, but there was one who sits up high and looks down low. Uh, and that stepped out of nowhere and stood on nothing and made everything. Uh, and he took notice of a seven-year-old boy uh, that nobody else was interested in. Nobody else would have cared about. Uh, and he reached down and he convicted him and he touched him and he saved him. Hey, I say to you, there's something exciting about the reality that God took notice of you. Amen. Uh, Who am I, said the songwriter, that a king would bleed and die for? Who am I that that he would shed his blood for? I'm reminded of the potentate. He, He came to where we was. God came to us because we couldn't come to himself. But then I notice this. Notice that the Scriptures and the Holy Ghost puts in the Word, the words that he wants us to have, and he puts those things there for emphasis. Notice the text with me again in verse 15. I'm going to read this, and in this fashion, I want you to see it. The Bible said it came to pass that while they communed together in reason, Jesus drew near and went with them. Now, if you were paying attention, you'll notice that I omitted one word in the reading of that verse. It does not take away from the grammatical accuracy of the statement. Nor does it change the accuracy of the comment that was made. And yet our King James Bible, for emphasis purpose, added one word in the midst of that statement. And it just simply said, Jesus Himself. Amen. Thank God. Jesus Himself uh, drew near. I, I'm glad my conversion not only involves a potentate, for I couldn't save myself. It took the God of heaven uh, to save me. Amen. But I'm also glad it's personal. <laughs> Amen. Uh, Listen, you might have got saved, and there might have been 50 that got saved the night you got saved. But if you got saved, it was a personal experience of grace. Amen. I say thank God for that. I'm glad that the Lord takes a personal interest in us as individuals. I'm glad He loves us that much. I'm glad He cares about us that much. I'm glad that He takes that type of interest in us. He came for us. Amen. 
but he came personally. <laughs> Amen. May I say you could have sat in a room with a hundred people, but he spoke to you that night. Amen. He told you he loved you that night. Amen. Boy, I'm glad. Listen, listen, Melissa and I have been married uh, going on 19 years, almost 19 years. When I, when I got married to Melissa, when, I, when we had wedding day, I, I didn't send somebody else up there to stand in for me. Amen. I mean, uh, when, we, when we headed to Concord, North Carolina, had to say our vows and uh, unite ourselves in holy matrimony, I didn't send somebody else. I, I had lots of friends that were coming. We had a host of folks at the wedding. But I didn't say to some of them, why don't you stand in for me? Oh, yeah. hey, it's a personal thing. Man, I'm telling you, you and I need to understand that he loves you. Amen. Amen. And he loves you personally. And it's a personal salvation. I say, I, I'm bothered. Listen to me, I'm bothered. Because we've got a generation that's come along and they've lost their all of salvation. They've lost sight of what it cost to purchase their salvation. They've lost sight of what God did at Calvary on their behalf. And they've lost, fight, they've lost sight of the fact that it's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Bothers me. Yeah. You know, I have holy heartburn in our churches because unless somebody gets caught up in a corporate worship environment, they have nothing personal in their hearts. Huh? Amen? Hey, listen to me. Listen to me. I'm all for, man, I'm telling you, when the singing is going on, our God forbid you actually shout every once in a while when the preaching's going on. It's really not a sin. Somebody say amen right there. You get all excited and we worship when we're amongst the brethren and we're amongst our, our Christian folks and our Christian acquaintances. But the heart of the relationship we have with Christ is not felt on a church pew in the midst of a corporate worship experience. But what we have with Christ uh, that can be felt in the middle of the night when nobody else is around or nobody else is awake. It can be, it can be felt driving down the road when nobody else in the car. It can be felt out in your prayer closet. It can be felt out in the edge of the woods. Uh, it can be felt when nobody else is around. You can feel it when the music Music's not playing. You can feel it when the preacher's not preaching. You can just feel it because you're communing with the God of heaven. And he whispers, I love you, I love you, I love you. And there's a personal nature to our conversion. He loves us. Amen. Uh, the, the conversion is seen in the potentate. It's Jesus that comes. And then the path, and then we see it's personal. It's himself. Uh, I like this last statement in this context. He said, drew near. Jesus himself drew near. Uh, not only is there, is there evidence of the pursuit of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I don't know if that thrills you, but I wasn't looking for God. Amen. I used to hear my pastor at the time, a fellow named Lamar Purcell, and Brother Purcell used to talk about, I'd tell his testimony. He said, I got saved at the Double Springs Baptist Church in Denver, Georgia. And he said, I was 17 years old, and he said, he said, I was invited to come to a revival meeting. I knew the church well. I'd preach there often myself. And he said, I was invited to come to a, a, a revival meeting, and he said, I don't know who the evangelist was. I don't know who the special music was. He said, I didn't go to see God. And I didn't go to see the people of God, but he said, I heard there was some pretty girls up there. <laughs> Amen. Or y'all died like that was an abnormal thing. Say amen right there. Amen. And he said, there were some girls up there. I wanted to go and see if I could see the girls that were up there. But he, he used to say, I didn't go looking for God, but he came looking for me. <laughs> amen. He left the splendor of heaven. And he came to where you were. I'm talking about the thrill of our salvation. And it reminded that the potentate of glory loved me. Yeah. Enough that he died for me personally and me alone so that he could have a relationship just with me. Yeah. But then I want you to understand something. To make that a reality, he came and found me. I wasn't looking for God. I wasn't searching for God. I was empty. I was needy. But it was Christ that came to where I was and Christ that came to where you were and that thrills me. Hallelujah. He pursued me. Man, when you get to looking at the big picture of God's salvation, you understand that He planned it. 
And then he paid for it. And then he pursues it. And when you come to him, uh, because he first came to you, uh, he performs it. And when you get done, you stand back on the sideline and you say, I didn't, he did. Amen. Abraham was summoned to the covenant territory grounds by the God of heaven. He'd already had several interactions with God. And God said, I want to meet you at the covenant ground. I want to make a covenant with you. Now, that's bigger than a contract. That's stronger than the laws can bind. And this time it's not between two men, which was very binding, a lifetime binding. But he said, this time it's between me and God. There's a problem with that. You see, when men entered into a covenant, they both brought something to the table. Generally speaking, they were considered peers, equals. Rarely did a man make a covenant with somebody that wasn't equal to the same territory or the same plane of life that he was. And yet, here's a unique situation. The man Abraham's been called by the God of heaven. I want to make a covenant with you. I wonder if Abraham thought, what am I going to bring? What can I take to the covenant ground? I uh, in a normal set of operations, you know, both men might bring equal sacrifices. One could bring oxen, the other could bring sheep, but in the end they had an equal number of sacrifices and they would come to that covenant ground to make a covenant and, and God called Abraham to the covenant ground and Abraham probably wrung his hands and fretted and thought, what in the world am I going to take? What am I going to bring to her into a covenant with God? And he brought nothing. And he shows up empty. Man, when I got called by God, I was empty. And he comes by, and then and, and they go down to the covenant ground, and then the Bible said God made a deep sleep to fall on Abraham. And he, he went to sleep right there in the middle of the covenant exercise. And, and the ceremony's transpiring. And he wakes up, Brother Kurt, when he wakes up, he said, I saw a candle or a light passing amongst the pieces of the sacrifice. Wait a minute. Uh, he said, when I laid my head down, uh, there was no sacrifice. I had nothing to bring. And so God has already taken the sacrifice. Uh, he made the sacrifice. Uh, and now in the symbolism of the covenant, uh, it's God that's passing amongst the pieces of the sacrifice. And when they got done, he said, welcome to the covenant, Abraham. You didn't bring anything. I brought everything. But you're in. Now, I say, thank God, almost 50 years ago, I went to the covenant ground, uh, lost and on my way to hell. Uh, and Jesus showed up. Uh, and man, I'm telling you, he brought the sacrifice. Uh, he cut up the pieces. He passed amongst them. Uh, and he saved this old sinner. Uh, and he said, welcome to the family. Uh, uh, you're in. I had nothing to bring. Uh, I had nothing to give. Uh, but he brought everything. That all excite us. The pursuit of the Savior. He came to where we were. And then I noticed not only does the text remind us of the conversation, uh, the, the conversion, but you'll also see the companionship. Look again in verse number 15 as we go back to our text. The Bible said Jesus himself drew near. There's our conversion. But then the latter part of verse number 15 said, and hallelujah. I mean, I'm telling you, and he went with them. I sure am glad the day that he saved you, he didn't leave you. Amen. Does it not help you that there is a companionship in the Savior that bypasses and surpasses anything this world has to offer? Amen. Amen. There will come a place and a time and a circumstance and a situation where your friends and family and acquaintances that are dearest to you cannot travel and they cannot traverse. But I sure am glad there's one and they said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. And there's a steadfast companion. And the day he started walking with me, though I've not always chose to walk with him, he's never been absent. He's never not been accounted for. He's always been there. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, if you listen, I'm just trying to tell you your heart ought to be burning. There ought to be something getting stirred up inside of you. Amen. Why? Because you're saved. Because of your conversion and all that Christ did to save you. How about the fact he didn't just save you, but he offers his companionship? Oh my. Can I can I say something to you? I don't want to linger on this too long, but I'll just quickly mention it. Do you know that's always been the will of God and the heart of God 
is to have companionship with his creation. I believe that's why he made Adam. I believe he did. I mean, I'm telling you, he had all the angelic host. Of course, we know that under the air of Lucifer, they'd already fallen. Many of them, a third of them, had already fallen in their sins. Amen right there. But he wanted somebody that would walk with him because they chose to walk with him. So he reached down in the dust of the earth and he made Adam. Amen. He wanted to walk with Adam. So he comes at the cool of the day and he walks with him and he talks with him and they fellowship and he worships him. And I love what the old Puritan writer I read after years ago said on the faded day of Adam's transgression. He said God was in his appointed place at the appointed time. Amen. He said it was man that was hiding in the garden. But God was at the gate. Why? Because that's what he came for. He wanted to have companionship. He wanted to walk with Adam. But he had a problem now. Adam has transgressed his law and sinned, and they can no longer fellowship because sin is a separator. And so he comes and he veils himself in the veils of invisibleness because the Bible said when, when God showed up on the day of Adam's sin that it was the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden. It wasn't, it wasn't the image of God. It was the voice of God because he had been therefore until the end of time. He'd be known as the invisible God. He'd veil himself in invisibleness lest his countenance destroy the creation that had sinned. Uh, and he couldn't walk with him anymore. And you ought to study that lineage. It's pretty intriguing. When you get to the son of Seth, the Bible said, then men begin to call on the name of the Lord. <laughs> That's good. I mean, he wanted men to talk to him, but that wasn't what he was looking for. And you go a couple more generations, and there's a fella who's born whose name is Enoch. And Enoch's an oddball. Now, y'all going to laugh about this, but you got to see it biblically. Enoch is a young daddy. I mean, a real young daddy. He's just 65. But if you look at all of his predecessors, they didn't start their families till they were in their hundreds. And, and Enoch finds himself going to have a baby at the age of 65. And the Bible said there's something about that encounter that causes him to begin to walk we are the, the Lord. And by the way, you'll never find but only two men. It's not mentioned, but three times in your Bible. And two men, one is Enoch, and the other was his great-grandson Noah. And it was of those men, the Bible said, they walked with God. Now, I'm telling you, there's those that walked. They, they walked behind him. They followed him, amen, and were led by him. But the Bible is speaking about their companionship, about their fellowship, one with another. And the Bible said Enoch walked with God. God. That's what God had been looking for. And that's what He wants out of you. And that's what He wants out of me. And He wants to be a companion that will sojourn with us. He wants to have a hand in every aspect of our lives. He wants to get you in the morning. He wants to know you in the noontime. He wants to lay down with you at night. He wants to be there when your heart's troubled in the hours of the midnight. That's what He wants to do. He is a steadfast companion. And He'll bring you to a sure finish. He will not leave you along the pathway. Amen. Amen. Psalmist said, Psalms 23. Don't you love Psalms 23? Speaks to so many areas of your life. It's a progressive psalm, by the way. I don't have time to deal with all that. But verse 1 is conversion. Verse 2 is walking with a shepherd. Verse 3 has a little bit of straying. And then the will of God in the shepherd's life. The will of God brings him to a dark valley, the valley of the shadow of death. But in that valley, he stops talking about the shepherd, and he starts talking to the shepherd. Look at the person of the text. And when he comes out, he's still talking to the shepherd. And he gets up on that high plane in verse number 5, and he said, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. And you squeak into verse number 6, and verse number 6 said, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Amen. Favorite funeral psalms. Really not about death. It's about living. Six verses, five and a half of those verses is not about dying. It's about living. Amen. And his conclusion was, 
He said, he'll follow me all the days of my life. How many, Brother Kurt? All of them. Even in the good times and the bad times. In the mountains and the valleys. When things are well and when things are not well. When the burdens are heavy. When the rain is pouring. When the storms are blowing. He said, I will be with you all the way. And he said, don't worry. When life is over, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Now, there was a peace at the end of the way. There's a sure finish. He will go with you. He wants to walk with you. He wants to have that companionship with you. What will cause your heart to burn? The coming near the Savior. Right down number two. I'd say in the context of Luke 24, not only the coming near the Savior, but the conversation of the saints. Amen. If eating right or not eating right will cause you to have holy heartburn, what you eat will cause you to have natural heartburn, then can I tell you that what you ponder on and what you think about is liable to cause you to have holy heartburn. Amen. Amen. There's a conversation that takes place. Look at verse number 14. And the Bible said, And they talked together of all these things which had happened. They communed together in verse number 15. And they reasoned according to verse number 15. But then when you drop down to verse number 17, the Lord asked them what manner of communication are these that you have one to another as you walk and are sad and when you continue to read on, you begin to find out what they were talking about. One of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And Jesus said, or he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Here's what they wanted to talk about. Here's what they were conversing about. They said, Jesus of Nazareth. The conversation of the saints can cause you to have a little bit of holy heartburn. Amen. What was it these disciples were talking about? Let me give you a little bit of insight. Verse number 19, they spoke about Christ's person. In verse number 19, as I begin to read that, he said unto them, What things are these, he said, concerning Jesus of Nazareth? Now I remind you dispensationally that these men have only heard what Christ has done, and yet they've not seen evidence of the resurrection. So there's a little bit of doubt. There's certainly some confusion, but that's what Jesus is going to clarify For he begins to expound unto them the scriptures and those things concerning himself. But when they speak to him in verse number 19, they want to make sure that they present this Jesus of Nazareth. Remember, they don't know it's him. Mark said that he appeared unto them in another form. And, uh, and, and so they don't know who this man is. They, they do not perceive him to be the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, and so when they speak to him and they're speaking about Jesus, they want to make sure that they identify him as something out of the ordinary. They want to deal with the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they said he was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. Now they ain't quite got it all down in their theology. They quite grasped that this was God's Son given as a propitiation for their sins. But what they do know is that this man that they had been with for the last three years or so was not an ordinary individual, and that there was something extraordinary about him. And may I say, if we get back to talking about how extraordinary of the Lord Jesus Christ he is, and no sweeter name I know, no greater subject could we share. I believe we'd go to talking about his person uh, and declared his deity. Uh, I believe it caused our hearts to burn again. Uh, and there's something exciting about the uniqueness of Christ. He's, he's one of a kind. Amen. He's the God man. He came in flesh, but he was all God. Hallelujah. You go to talking about that and see if something don't well up on the inside. Amen. By the way, you've got the Holy Ghost inside of you, and Jesus said he will not speak of himself, but he will speak of me. And I believe that when he hears you begin to speak about the Savior, that which is on the inside will bear witness. The Holy Spirit within you will bear witness with the words that you're saying. Uh, you'll begin to feel that bubble on the inside. You'll say as they did in the Old Testament, spring up. Oh, well, spring up. Spring up. Verse number 19, they spoke about his person. Verse number 20 through 24. Catch this now. They spoke about his passion. The next thing, they begin to transition the conversation in verse number 20. They talk about how wonderful he was in verse number 19. But then when they shift into verse number 20, they say our rulers delivered and condemned him to death, and they have crucified him. They crucified him. Now, when they begin to talk about his passion, hang on. 
They're going to talk about how that he was wrongly done, how their rulers took advantage of him. They're getting caught up in the politicalisms, but you and I do well to take a journey to Calvary. Amen. I ask this question often in preaching. When's the last time you visited Calvary? Amen. I've never got on an airplane and went to the Holy Land and been to the places that they tell us perhaps might be Calvary as we know it, the place of the skull. But I don't need to go in a physical sense, but I'm talking about in a spiritual sense. When's the last time you stood at the cross and watched the Son of God die in your place and you begin to see the suffering of the Savior on your behalf? And friend, if that don't stir up something, I don't know how you'll ever get stirred up. He did it on your behalf. Amen. They talked about how He died for them. They talked about His passion. They talked about His suffering. They talked about His crucifixion. And if you and I get our conversation centered on the Savior, our heart just might burn within us. Let me give you this. Verse 19, they spoke about His person. Verse number 20, they spoke about His passion. But then as you walk out of verse 20 into verse 21, the Bible said, but we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. Then I want you to just hear this little statement. Hear me. I want you to hear me just for a minute. And uh, I, don't want to, I don't want to read into this text something that's not there, but I believe if you'll bear with me just a moment, I believe I can show it to you. Now, they're talking about, and the Bible refers to the Scriptures to refer to us as the fact that they're troubled, that they're sad. He said, uh, why are you troubled about this? Why are you sad about this thing? And they said, haven't you heard and you heard it was Jesus. He was a phenomenal individual and they crucified him. He's dead. And we trust him. We trust him. Now there's a discouragement and a defeat and, and all of that in that. We trusted it would have been he that should have delivered Israel. And it's as though if that's just all we had. Fellas, if that's all we had, it'd be over, it'd be defeat, it'd be it'd be it'd be beyond doubt. But what prompted Cleopas, and I'm assuming it's Cleopas speaking still, what prompted Cleopas to say in the end of verse number 21, and if you notice the the, uh, the punctuation of the sentence is a colon. We trusted there had been he which should have redeemed Israel, colon. Now they tell me when they put a colon there that the sentence has to make a definite turn. If it's a semicolon, it can go on and it's just explaining what was going on before. But if it's a colon, it has to be a turn on the same subject. <laughs> they crucified him. He's dead. We'd hoped he'd be the one that would, re- would, uh, would save us. And, of course, that was a physical deliverance from the hands of the tyrants of Rome. But then the Holy Ghost let him put a colon in. And we looked deeper into the heart of Cleopas. And he said, Beside all that. Man, the dark clouds are hovering and the trouble is all around us and the doubt is real in my mind. But he said, and beside all this, I see a little glimmer. <laughs> there might be a light at the end of the tunnel. He said, and beside all of this, <laughs> this is the third day. There was something about that third day began to ring in his heart. He said, it's the third day. And he said, if that wasn't enough, that it's the third day. He said, we've got rumors. Rumors are around and circulating around Jerusalem that some of our women were up at the tomb when the dawn came up this morning. And they told us angels showed up. We don't know, man. We ain't never seen angels, but angels showed up. And the stone had been rolled away. And we ain't seen his body. Nobody knows where he is, but it's the third day. You know what those are talking about? I think they talked about his person. He's extraordinary. They talked about his passion. He died. But now they're talking about his promise. <laughs> There's just something inside of them. He said something, Brother Kurt, about tearing down this tabernacle and building it again in three days. 
Yeah. We've been working on the tabernacle. We've been working on the temple 40 years and hadn't finished it yet. Mm. But he said, he said three days he built it back again. Speaking, of course, about the temple of his. It's been three days and now there's an empty tomb and a, a missing body. We, we're not willing to commit yet. We don't know all the answers yet. Mm. We don't have it all figured out yet. But there just might be something to his promise. Yeah. He said they'd kill him, but he wouldn't stay dead. Uh, and man, if you get to talking about his promises. Uh, Hey, by the way, you and I are talking about a promise. Now, we're not talking about the promise of the resurrection. They did. Because they were standing in a particular time when they'd yet to have proof positive that Christ had risen from the dead. But according to 1 Corinthians 15, he showed himself upwards of 500 of the brethren at one time. They've seen him. He's alive. Hey, we're not talking about the promise of his resurrection. We're talking about the promise of his return. And the storm clouds are gathered and, and sin is rampant and, and wickedness abounds. And man, I'm telling you, I ain't got it all figured out, and I don't know when he's coming. Uh, but he said, I will come again. Uh, and I'm going to tell you, there's something to be said uh, about talking about the promise of God. Uh, uh, just look up, church. Just look up. Uh, uh, Jesus, he is coming. Uh, just like he said he would. That will cause you to have heartburn. He's coming. He's coming. What will cause your heart to burn? Number one, the coming near the Savior. Number two, the conversation of the Savior. Let me give you the third thing and I'm done. Now the Scriptures tell us that after Cleopas speaks his mind, the Lord chimes in, verse number 25. And he said, O fools and slow of heart, believe all the prophets have spoken, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory. And the great schoolmaster, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, expanded unto them in all the Scriptures the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh to the village where they went. And I don't understand verse 28. I don't understand the hidden condition of his identity. He did. I just believe it. Amen. Amen. But, and I, I don't understand verse 28, although I, I kind of get the gist of it. He said as he drew near where they went, he knew they were home. He made as though he would have gone further. I got to keep going. It's been good talking to you men. I'm going on. But they constrained him. My, my. Now, if you study the Middle Eastern culture, they like to invade personal body space. Oh, my. Oh, my. I mean, talk to me all you want to talk to me, but don't get in my face. Something rises up inside of me I don't particularly care for if you get in my face. Amen. Leave me my space. Amen. But if you're in the Middle East, that's not the way it's done. They're going to get right in your face. I mean, that's just the culture and the nature. And when the Bible said they constrained him, most likely it literally implies they got a hold of him. They held on to him. They blocked his path. One got on one side and one on the other. Amen. Hey, you're not going anywhere. The Bible said they constrained him. And here's what they said in verse number 29, abide with us, abide with us. But I got good news. Look how it turned out. The Bible said he went in to tarry with them. Amen. I understand there's a cultural thing. The guest gets first dibs, all that kind of stuff. But I kind of like this part. There's pretty good evidence in verse number 30 that when he came in, he took over. Who's breaking the bread? Who's turning things? Hey, man, who's doing the talking? Who's doing the praying? Hey, can I tell you what Christ done when he took into our lives? He wanted to take over. Amen. He didn't come to be a guest. He come to take up residence. And the Bible said they said they constrained him. And, and, and may I say the coming near of the Savior will give you heartburn. And the conversation of the saints will give you heartburn. But the constraining of his servants will give you heartburn. Just get a hold of him and say, I will not let go. Let me explain this to you. This principle is ignited in, in verse number 29 where they said, Abide with us. That three words, abide with us. And really I, 
I guess to be perfectly honest about it, I would have to expand that to two statements. One, that he abides in us and we abide in him. You can look at John chapter 15. Except you abide in me and I in ye, ye can do nothing. Uh, and, 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 and first John chapter number two, it talks about he abides in us and we abide in him. Amen. And, and, and may I say to you that the, that the key to the Christian life, the key to a burning heart, the key to power in our service, the key to everything spiritual is this statement, He must abide in us. Amen. Without Him, we can do nothing. Amen. Amen. Oh, abiding with us is the key to our fellowship. Abiding with us is the key to our faithfulness. Abiding with us is the key to our fruitfulness. Amen. We must be as Clara Williams wrote in the great hymn of the church, Satisfied. She said, uh, Hallelujah, I have found him whom my soul so long has craved. Jesus satisfies my longings through his life. I now am saved. The search is over. I found him. I'm not looking anymore. I found him. He's what I was longing for. I found him. He's what I was craving. I found him. He's what eternity demanded. I found him. I'm not going to the world. I found him. I'm not looking and seeing. I found him. I'm not going to what I used to be in the pug pit. I found him. But it's about him. It's about a party in him. And yet, and yet that's such an elusive subject and an elusive thing for us as believers to abide in Christ and have him abide in us. And it's the key to everything. And we find it almost beyond our reach. You say, I wouldn't say that, brother. I wouldn't say, well, Paul did. He said, in my mind, I know what to do, but the will to do it I don't find. Huh? We're battling this old rotten, stinking flesh, and it's contrary to the leadings of the Spirit of God and the work of the Holy Ghost in our lives. The book of Genesis has a similar story, doesn't it? You remember it. You remember it in Genesis chapter number 32. There's a character there named Jacob. Jacob means surplanter, deceiver. How'd you like to go through life with a name like that? But it was the right name for Jacob. And he finds himself running from his brother because of the wrongs that he's done. And the scripture said as he's running from his brothers, and I don't have time to deal with all this, this was not his first encounter with God nor the angels of God. You go back and look at it, there's at least two other instances. But sometime in the middle of the night, the Bible said he began to wrestle with a man. Now, we believe that to be a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's evidences in there. He knows it's God by the end of the conversation. He said, I've managed to live, though I saw God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But, but, but God had taken on a, another form. And he said he wrestled with this man until the breaking of the dawn. And in the breaking of the dawn, hear the man say to Jacob, let me go for the day breaks. Let me go for the day breaks. The sun is coming up. Sounds a little bit like he would have gone further. But what did Jacob say? Do you remember the conversation? Jacob said, I will not let you go. Except you bless me. Hallelujah. He said, I'm not going to turn loose until you do something in my life. He said, I've missed my opportunities in the past. But I'm not going to miss this one. I'm not going to let go. Hallelujah. And I'm almost persuaded it's like a father wrestling with a small child, Brother Kirk. And he's got that kid on top of him. He said, let me go, let me go. Knowing he could have slung him off 
at any time he chooses, but what he wants is the determination and the commitment out of the mouth of that child. No, I'm not going to let go. I'm holding on until you do something for me. And it's as though there's a wink, wink, and a yes. That's exactly what I wanted him to do. I wanted his determination. I wanted his commitment. I'm not going to let go until you do something. I won't leave like a cave. I've got to have something from God. And then he said, all right, son, tell me your name. You know what he could have said, Brother Jody? Here's what he could have said. He could have said, I'm the son of Isaac. That would have been pretty impressive. I'm the son of Isaac. Because we all know Abraham and Isaac. We all know Abraham and Isaac. You know, these are the chosen of God. He said, I could have said, I'm the son of Isaac. But he didn't say that. You know what he said, Brother David? He said, Almost as though I think he dropped his head. I don't know if he did or not. But I almost imagine he dropped his head on his chin. Didn't want to say it real loud because he's pretty ashamed of it. He said, my name's Jacob. He said, I'm just a deceiver. I've never gotten anything that I didn't deceive my way into and cheat my way into and lie my way into. He said, I'm just a deceiver. I'm nothing. But I sure want something from you. And when that act of repentance was made, and when that act of clarity was made, and when he came clean, Brother Dalton, the God of heaven said, you'll not be called Jacob anymore. He said, we're going to give you a new name. And he said, today you'll be known as Israel. He said, because you're a prince with God, and you have prevailed yeah. Amen. And God, and, 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 and listen, the Lord vanished out of his sight as the sun began to rise that morning. And Jacob said, I saw God. I've been in the presence of God. And you remember in the middle of the wrestling match, the Bible said he touched him in the, in the, uh, the, the, the hollow of his thigh, he touched him. What it said, knocked his knee out of joint, knocked his leg out of joint. Man, it's hard enough to wrestle when you got two legs intact and he's wrestling with one leg that's incapacitated, but he's holding hold with all he's got. And he said, I won't let go until you do something for me. And he said, when God vanished and he realized he'd seen God, the Bible said that he limped. He walked away that morning and everybody could see something was different about him. But he got something from God. He might have had to lean on his cane, but he got something from God. He might not have been traveling very fast, but he got something from God. He might not have slept the night before, but he got something from God. And I say, if you want your heart to burn, get a hold of it and say, I won't quit. I won't let go. I won't take no for an answer in that regard. I won't go. God in my life. I want God's presence, God's power, God's touch, God's realness. I want to be satisfied with God. And if you get there, your heart will burn, beloved. Your heart will burn. And I promise you that when tomorrow's light comes, somebody will say you're different. What happened in your life? When's the last time you just wrestled with God? When's the last time you constrained Him and said, I want more than an hour and a half church service? When's the last time you said, the world's too dark and the way's too difficult and the burdens are too heavy for me not to have something from God? Amen! And you just got to hold on, and you got to cling to him, and you got to constrain him, and then, friend, let him change you. That's what he did for Jacob. That's what he did for those Emmaus, too. They got up with enough, hey, they got up with enough thrill about their soul, though it's after dark. They walked seven and a half miles back and had a message to tell. Heartburn. Holy heartburn. When's the last time you just had a good dose of spiritual indigestion? When God was bigger than you, greater than you, and you knew his presence in a satisfying way. I'm just telling you, the Holy Ghost moving around in here, you probably need to do business with him. Somebody probably needs to find him an altar. They need to get a hold of God and say, I'm not going to let go. i got to have something. 
I can't face tomorrow like I face today. I've got to have something from God. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Let's stand. Come on with our song invitation, Brother David. Folks already coming. People responding. Did not her heart burn within us? Wasn't his presence something extraordinary? And we've tried this too long in the flesh. We can't even keep from sinning in the flesh. Nevertheless, serving. Why don't you come to him? And let him be what satisfies you like he was the day he saved you. Folks, pray to their seat. Pray to the altar. They're ready to sing.